A very warm welcome to you all here at the Global Influence Club's Breaking Barriers to Trade, Uganda Chapter 3. I felt it was necessary to create a platform that brought together government, policymakers, business leaders and entrepreneurs to discuss, to knowledge share, to connect, to network and to create new business relationships. There is a widely available evidence base that shows women entrepreneurs are less likely to be successful to access debt and equity financing than their male counterparts. When they do, they typically receive less funding and they pay higher interest rates and are required to provide more collateral. Government has invested 1.3 trillion in Uganda Development Bank and 50% of that money is actually for women. It is deliberate because we know that it is important to transform. Invest in a woman, you've invested in a nation. And I tell you about these opportunities, please. Let's go and seize the opportunities. And if you have a challenge, don't hesitate to reach out to me. The women who were here last year, who reached out to me, I actually handheld them and they got the money. To empower this woman to a level of an entrepreneur, you have to deal with some basics. And one of the basics is water supply. If you want to violate a woman's dignity, send her to a, a sanitation facility that is not sanitary. For us men, you know, we can jump and do our thing there, but for a lady, you are just degrading this lady. So it affects the dignity of, of the woman at whatever stage. You need energy at home for cooking, you need energy for lighting, you need energy that could also be used to pump this water that we are talking about, because it is more sustainable to use renewables to pump water, because of the low tariff. So we have had partnerships with, with uh, uh, companies both in, in the country and from outside to try and promote low energy for pumping. In the course of my work over the last 30 years, I have realized that uh, women do not only deserve, it's, it's, a, it's a human right. So if you can empower this lady or, or, or young woman, then we have a very good chance of producing men and women who are empowered without prejudice. I'm promoting Uganda for uh, several reasons, but one of them, obviously, this um, big supporter for uh, women entrepreneurs here. And geographically, you have a preferential place in the center of East Africa, which could connect. If you start here, you can uh, advance to neighboring countries like Tanzania, Kenya, Sudan, or uh, Congo, etc. So you have a great potentiality. It's time to make it into reality. We are lucky in this country that the most important thing that everyone, every woman needs is peace and security. Because when there's war, the first person who becomes a victim is actually the woman. The woman's future is ruined. And I'm very happy, Ma'am Baroness, for you to invite uh, Engineer Wilbur to talk about water, because those are the challenges. I grew up in a rural area. The good news is that you always have to look at the positive side of the issues. And women, we are very good at that. We are, it's so easy for us to, to look at the positive side and collect ourselves and move on. So addressing these long-standing barriers for women entrepreneurs to access finance could create five to six trillion dollars globally if we were to act today. What exciting initiatives is your organization involved with um, that are being implemented concerning, today we're speaking climate and infrastructure. And Green Hub East Africa is a, a new green initiative created by Nexus Green and Motocare. And what it's doing is that we're implementing an e-mobility ecosystem. So providing electric border borders together with affordable um, lease to own models together with asset financing and also public charging infrastructure as well. Transport is one of the biggest contributors uh, to air pollution and especially in uh, Kampala. So for one Boda rider to switch from uh, a petrol Boda to an electric Boda, they can both in their pockets make 30% more profits every day. So it's also that social and economic empowerment, but each boat driver will also, every year, save two and a half tons of CO2. Three weeks ago, uh, our first 13 women graduated the three weeks training program. 
that we've implemented together with Women Racing for Africa. Decarbonizing the power generation sector through renewable energy that is flexible, schedulable and dispatchable is an essential pivot on the path to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. This was discussed at the World Economic Forum this year. As an ardent advocate of renewable energy, there is still much to be done to achieve net zero by 2050. New technologies, new innovations, new industries are being created, working with traditional existing sectors to enable huge potential employment opportunities and economic growth. We are looking at now climate and climate change. How are we contributing to that? The other one is wellness. Sugar has been identified as affecting uh, people if it's in large amounts. So already we have produced for you the zero versions. We have Pepsi Zero. And, but also we are producing, we are reducing the sugar in some of the other brands. We have reduced considerably the amount of plastic in each bottle and uh, therefore, you know, there's less. And the next stage which we are working, the global company is working very hard on, the one you can throw away and it will decompose. There have been increasing efforts on both national and international levels to better understand the gender dimension. Women are challenged by numbers and figures and record keeping. So I would suggest that if you're thinking of going international, going global, there are many initiatives in this country that can help you to train and understand how to manage your numbers, understand how to keep your records, and understand how now to interface with the international community. Stanbic Business Incubator is one of the subsidiaries for Stanbic Uganda Holdings. We are, look at us as a sister company to the Stanbic Bank, and really our mandate is to build capacity of small and growing businesses and we do this through capacity building, we train lots of businesses in improving your quality, getting you to a stage where you can be able to trade your products. We also specialize in linking you to access to finance opportunities. The major things that we need to do as government is you know, enhance the competitiveness of our country. Many of you are traders, we import a lot of goods. From Mombasa to here, it can take you a week or so. We need to invest in the key infrastructure that will support bringing down the cost of doing business in our country. So the SGR railway, the, the, the investment in key transport infrastructure is very critical for making Uganda more competitive. How do we now bridge the gap to see that we can take care of our 85% community? My question goes to Mo, who talked about electrification of uh, border, border borders. And I'm just wondering whether that is really actually happening. And with the high cost of electricity, whether it will be viable. Within our concept, every single rider gets uh, trained. You have to have a driver's license and be a trained driver to be able to, to do this. And as more as we scale, this will, will see significant impact in Kampala and across society with this. E-mobility is already a proven business model in many countries across the world and it's actually an even better business model in Uganda because in Kenya they can make a 30% profit increase but Uganda has cheaper energy, we have more energy and we also have um, cheaper prices in general. So in Uganda the 30% mar profit margin is actually on the lower end this conference is not about displacing men. It is about creating space for women. It all starts with an opportunity to have that first conversation, to be in the room, to have a voice. Having these exceptional women that are entrepreneurs yes. and leaders in their fields come to talk about or demystify um, work-life balance is really important. How do you manage juggling everything that you have together. In my career journey, or every time I have been in a community, I don't take things for granted. So for the people who might not know what work-life balance is, work-life balance is the equilibrium between your professional life 
and your personal life. As simple as that. But if you abuse any of those two, you'll find yourself in a place they call burnout. Burnout is a place where you are emotionally, physically, and mentally exhausted. Childcare was really difficult. I had to change my priorities. I was trying to find someone to help me find a, you know, help me look for, um, help me look after my child while I work. And the most painful thing I think I've ever done in my life, if you know my story, is sending my son back to Uganda so I can focus on working. I sent him back to Uganda, and it was very painful. But obviously, us being women, and you're like, I still have to achieve what I need to achieve. I worked crazy. I literally didn't want to rest for a minute until I achieved what I wanted to achieve. And obviously moving back to Uganda, everything's different in Uganda. You have so much help. You know, you can run around, do as much as you can. You can be at the farm, you can be at Bougie. You know, you can travel, you can delegate. So prioritizing in Uganda is very different because in Uganda, you can afford to pay someone to watch your child and it won't finish your entire salary. You know, so it's very different when you're in Uganda. So I'm right. so thankful that we live here now because you can attend such nice events and you get mm -hmm. to meet so many people and you know your child's safe. So delegating is the most important thing. Have you ever faced adversity? Has any of you ever dropped out of school and rejoined? Have you ever lost a job and, 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 and jumped onto something else? I, I, I'm looking for, for some experiences of ad overcoming adversity, okay, so, so that we can, we, can, we can all learn from it. The second part is this support system that we are talking about, yeah. getting some guy to go and do the shopping, picking kids or something yeah. like that. Are the men in your life, your spouse, your fiancés, are they part of this support system or are they all after your money? Always knew that if I'm to get married, I have to be married to someone who's transparent, who's honest, who, because I'm literally very transparent and I can't be with someone that's not transparent. And very important, the most important part, he has to be 10 times more hardworking than me because I work so hard Thank you. for me to sit and watch someone else enjoy the fruits of my labor. I wanted someone where I can enjoy the fruits of your labor. I could literally not do that without a part, like a supportive partner mm -hmm. who can actually hold you down emotionally, um, with the kids, financially even. Right. And also, it also extends to your immediate family. I have my sisters here, and they, you, you literally have to have so many people in your corner for this to be effective. Uh, I'd like Mommy, uh, to Remy and Pesh to give us uh, just a final 30 seconds about the advice you'd give women. Fourth industrial revolution is here. Whether you want or you don't want, Africans, my fellow people who came today, if there's a takeaway you can, I would delve in and teach you myself, but they've given me 30 seconds. Go onto the internet, use AI, find out what the fourth industrial revolution is and how you can modernize yourself. Step further, have hybrid businesses. Please, it's possible. Find a way to do technology with what you're doing. For you to be successful in entrepreneurship, you need to be bold. You're going to have to enter rooms twice for you to be accepted. And when I say twice, I don't mean get in, get out, and get in. You're going to make research, do corrections, fulfill what they're asking for, make sure you are serving the purpose that you're meant for. You're going to, be, you're going to have to be bold. Number two, you need partnerships. All these companies that you see, they're not built by one person. You need people. Women empowerment tells us, I can do it by myself, I can do it. No, you need help. Number three, you're going to need financial literacy. If you have to make money, you have to understand money. Lastly, you need to have something you believe in. If you are a woman of faith, you need to pray. You need to be believing someone. We've had the best panel. Uh, male allyship, good luck. It's so important that when we're talking about making things equal and accessible for women, that our male colleagues are in the room with us. I've always said it, we're not here to displace you, we just want to have some space for ourselves. And that's really key to how we want to hear from our speakers today on what they see in their organizations, what they're doing, 
and how they'd like to improve it. So I'm going to start from my right and work right down um, to, uh, to all the panelists. And I'll start with you, Honourable Dora. So just tell me, how do you feel that male allyship can work for us women? When you get into the political space, the main allies that we need with you, if you are going to advocate for a policy successfully, are men. Because the majority of members of parliament are men. When you go out looking for votes, the majority of the persons out there are men. They may not be actually the majority because they are about 50% and the women are more, but they are gatekeepers. They are gatekeepers. So we really need to be allies with them. We need to change the world. We need to create space for women. And if you put that as the main, if that was the enemy versus us dividing ourselves, how do we keep the focus on that? Are we creating space? Are we changing the world? How do you do that? A house divided cannot stand. I think that's from the good book. So I think for me to say for men, how do we create ourselves that that allyship is such that we just want to be better human beings. We want a better society. And I think if we do that, it will be a much more progressive and will make much faster progress. It's very easy for me. One, because I have uh, three living daughters. So when they're talking about uh, women and what women can do, and what my four-year-old daughter, who is the last born, what she can do, and I find, look, this is as normal as, you know, this is a person who can actually do it. So from an allyship perspective, is to ensure that we had the part of educating the girl child. Now when they come into the organization, what deliberate opportunities do you put in place to ensure that they actually rise up? It starts in the home. It starts on how we want to see the world. And we need to start getting that conversation started very, very early. And I'm so, so pleased that when you're the father of daughters, it becomes very prevalent. When it should be more prevalent is when you're the father of sons because that's when you really do start to shape behavior. So ladies and gentlemen, I really, really want to give a big, big thank you to our panelists today.